Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be talking about section 2.6, uh, and that's on transformations of functions. So um, the first thing that I should mention is uh, at the end of section 2.2, Uh, I mentioned in the video that there's a table. Uh, I didn't write down the table in the lecture video, but uh, there is a table of some common, what we're going to call parent functions. Um, and so this is going to be very useful for this section because what this section talks about is how basically how you take one of these parent functions, which is something very basic like y equals x squared. Um, that would be a parent function because it's just the variable itself and like nothing else really. Like there's no like plus something. So this section is talking about how we take a parent function and translate it in different directions you can or translates one of them, you can shift it up or down or to the right or left. You can shrink it vertically or horizontally. Uh, you can uh, reflect it across um, like the axes and, and stuff like that. So basically, yeah, there's a, there's a reference at the end of section 2.2 that'll be useful. All right, so we're gonna talk about all those things I just mentioned and what it looks like uh, when you do those things to a function. So let's say we have the graph of y equals f of x. And then it looks something like this. So that's just some random function. Uh, we don't know what it is, but we don't need to when we're talking about what happens to the function when we translate it. So a vertical shift um, is going to be like this. You take the whole graph and just shift it up by some uniform amount the whole time. All of these arrows are different sizes, but they should be the same size. You should get like a new graph like that. That's just very. It's the same thing, but shifted up. So this is what we want: is something like this. And if we just think about, um, so for this function, we plug in an x value. Let's say we plug in zero, and it just so happens that the output is zero because we have this point at the origin. So if we plug in 0, we get y equals 0. So if we plug in, so what we did, we shifted this up c. So this point that's at 0 should now be at c. So what do we need this expression to look like to make that true? It would be you want your output to be c, and your output of f of x was 0. So what you need this equation to be is f of x plus c. And we just kind of reason through that by looking at one point. But that's actually what's going on the, over the entire thing is if you plugged in this x value back here, you got this output right here. And here you get this output, which is c higher than the one before. So that's, that's what a vertical shift looks like. It's just that you take the whole graph and move every point up by whatever C is. For each x, f of x plus C is exactly C higher than f of x. And that's why we get the whole graph being moved up by C. So an example, we want a graph 
y equals x squared plus 3. So this is a situation where you have some parent function, oops, sorry, some parent function y equals x squared, and then you did the thing we just did, you did a plus c. So what we can do to graph this is we first look at the graph of x squared. That's why that table I mentioned is important because instead of, like for other functions, by now I'm, I'm sure most of you are, are uh, comfortable with y equals x squared, but there's some other functions that are more complicated that it's nice to just have a table of what they look like so that you can do this first step without any work. So we have this parent function, y equals x squared, and then what we did was we did a plus 3 on the outside. So we just learned that what that means is shift the whole graph up 3. And that's it. And then the key to this, uh, and we'll see like why it's why I'm saying it's the key. Um, C is getting added to the outside. of the parent function. And this is just kind of alluding to what I'm going to talk about next, which is horizontal shifting. Um, and we'll see what the difference is to as like where you add the C, like why that matters. All right, horizontal. Shifting. So again, start with y equals f of x. I'm going to use the same looking one that we had before, like that. And then I'm going to shift it to the to the left. So and then we'll just look at like what happens when you do that. So this should be this, the same looking function but shifted to the left and we're going to say if this is y equals f of x then what is this thing? So let's look at the point that I that I wrote that I colored in right here. This one we have f of zero equals zero. And I want this to be y equals something um, where this point negative c is zero. And we know f of zero is zero. And so we want, let's say y equals g of x. And what is g? We want 0 to equal g of negative c. And 0 was f of 0. So we want f of 0 to equal g of negative c. And so um, basically, we want the same output when we plug in 0 as when we plug in negative c. So what we can do is say that this means that f of x equals g of x plus c. So, or sorry, not g. We want the same output. So we want g to be f of x plus c, so that when we do g of negative c, we're actually doing f of negative c plus c, which is f of 0. So that's kind of like the idea behind that is um, we're take, if, if we move it to the left, in order to do that, we have to like 
put a plus C on the inside of the argument and I'll show you what that means. Okay, so first we're at the value of f of x plus c. is the value of f of x at x plus c. So right here we had g of x, which we're saying is f of x plus c. So the value of f of x plus c is the value of f of x at x plus c. So we wanted to know the value of f of x plus c at negative c and what we're saying is that that's the value of f of x at x plus c. So if x was negative c, then uh, x plus c is 0. So the value of f of x plus c is the value of f of x at 0. So the value of f of x plus c at negative c. All right, so just to formalize this, if we start with y equals f of x, then the graph of first y equals f of x plus c is that of y equals f of x. but shifted to the left, like we just saw, by C. So if you add C into the inside, then um, you shift to the left. And then likewise, we could show a similar, like, picture argument that we did before, but it should be intuitive that if you subtract C, it does the exact opposite. So if we subtract C from the inside, we shift to the right by C. Alright, so I'll show you an example of what exactly it means to like add something to the inside. So let's say we have this expression. This function y equals x plus 3 squared. Um, so the parent function is y equals x squared. So let's look at y equals x squared. And then we did a horizontal shift. So what the plus 3 on the inside means, and the inside means you're taking this expression, x squared, and you're replacing x with x plus 3, rather than taking the x squared and then just adding 3. So that's the difference. And as you know, this, is, this expression does not equal x cubed plus 3. It equals x cubed or sorry, not x cubed, x squared plus 3, it, what it equals is x squared plus 6x plus 9. So that and that are not the same. That's why we get different pictures, because they're different functions. So the graph of y equals x plus 3 squared is the same thing, but move to the left by 3. And that's y equals x plus 3 squared. And then just one last little quick example. What if we had both of the vertical and horizontal shift? So that's, we got a plus three on the inside of the argument and a plus three on the outside of the argument. So what we do, same as before, we look at the parent function, y equals x squared, and then just do what the shifting operators told us to do. 
which is move to the left three and move up three. So we can just take this vertex of the parabola, move it to the left three and then up three. And there it is. So that's negative three, three. All right, and now uh, another translation we can do, or trans I keep calling it translation, but I meant transformation. Uh, something else we can do is reflect it. So again, we start with y equals f of x, then the graph of y equals negative f of x, is that of y equals f of x, but reflected across the x-axis. And then we could have the negative on the inside of the argument. And that means that it's reflected across the y-axis. All right, and then I'll show you some pictures. So these are similar to what they have in the book, but so let's say this is y equals f of x. Um, then if I want to graph y equals negative f of x, uh, you can also just look at like at each x value. This is what f of x is. So if, if I wanted to plot negative f of x, I'll just go down instead. And if we do that for the whole thing, we just get like the same picture but reflected if you yeah you just reflect each point across the x-axis and that's what y equals negative f of x is and now if I had Let's say this is y equals, we'll use a different letter, g of x. Then if I did, if I wanted to do y equals g of negative x, then basically um, the graph of this would be um, like the, so if I wanted to, plot some specific x, then what I need to do is look at the original value at negative x. So like here, this is the value at negative x. So that's that's going to be the value right here. And as I go like a little bit further, like x plus 1, then it's going to be the value at negative x plus 1, which is negative x minus 1. So it's a little bit to the left of this point right here. So like this point, negative x plus 1, has that value. So like x plus 1 is going to have this value. And if we complete the picture, that's why we have that rule that uh, when you put the negative on the inside, it reflects it across the y-axis, because that's what it just did here. And again, these are abstract examples, but it works for any uh, function that you're familiar with. I'll show some examples of those. So, so we'll start with y equals x squared. And then we'll do both of what we just talked about. So I could put the negative on the outside of the x squared or I could put the negative on the inside 
of the x squared. And let's see what happens in each of these situations. So this is y equals x squared. And then the negative x squared means flip it across the x-axis. So pretty simple. And from our previous sections, we know that this is right for the graph of negative x squared. And then for the graph of negative x quantity squared, uh, what that meant was we uh, do a reflection across the y-axis. So if we look at our parent function and we do a reflection across the x-axis, you know, we take everything that's over here and do it exactly the opposite, then both sides of this just flip to be what the other side was before. So like, for example, this side right here just becomes this, and then this side right here becomes this. And actually what we're left with is the exact same graph. And it makes sense because that negative on the inside gets squared as well and just turns this whole expression into x squared, which is exactly what the original graph was. And we actually talked about this in a previous section that uh, if you can do that, if you can plug in negative x for x and get the same thing, that this has symmetry about the y-axis. So uh, just, yeah, another little bit of intuition is just you can look at this and say, okay, like this has symmetry across the y-axis, obviously. So when I plug in negative x for x, or in the sense of what we're talking about, putting a negative inside the argument, uh, then it'll actually do nothing to the function. All right, and then one more type of transformation would be stretching and sh shrinking either vertically or horizontally. So vertical stretching and shrinking. Start with y, uh, y equals f of x. So, yeah, if we start with y equals f of x, then if I wrote down y equals, oh, not f yet, but uh, y equals c times f of x, uh, then what that does is it stretches it vertically by a factor of c if c is bigger than 1. So stretches was the key there. If c is bigger than 1, then the graph of this gets stretched rather than shrunk uh, and vertically. Oh, not right in that yet. So, and then shrinks vertically by a factor of C if C is in between 0 and 1. So, uh, that's the only distinction is that um, it's always stretching but like uh, since we have two different english words for like stretching and shrinking if one's getting bigger or smaller uh, that's why there's two different distinctions so c being bigger than one makes every value of c times f of c bigger than f or not c times f of c c times f of x it would make every value of this c times the value of f of x so c being bigger than one makes that value bigger and then c being in between 0 and 1 makes that value smaller so that's just kind of the intuition behind that and then we could have 
horizontal stretching. So again, start with y equals f of x. Then if we have the c on the inside of the argument, what that does is it stretches by factor of c if c is in between 0 and 1. So it's kind of like we're kind of maintaining that sense of like oppositeness when things are happening inside the argument rather than outside of the argument. So if you have a c on the inside, then that c being less than 1 is going to make your graph bigger. And it shrinks by a factor of c if c is bigger than 1. And this, remember, was horizontal stretching and shrinking rather than vertical. All right, and so I'll draw several pictures of what I mean by all of this. So let's say, let's go back to this f of x. So this is y equals f of x. And let's say that this value is b, this value is a, like this. So what I'm going to do is do some things with like c equals two and a half, just so we can see like what's going on. So this is our original. And let's say I want to do y equals two f of x. Then what we said before is that a, a c like this two on the outside is going to stretch it vertically stretch because it's bigger than one so what happens is nothing happens horizontally so our our bounds of negative this should be negative negative b and b are the same but the height the the output of the function is twice as high at every point so we will go up to 2a and down to negative 2a. So it's going to look something like this. Oh, that was really bad. Still bad, but... <laughs> uh, so basically, it's the same thing, but it didn't... it got stretched vert vertically. Every point of this graph at a given x value is twice as high or twice as low as the point on the original graph. And then likewise, if our factor was 1 half, that would be something shrinking vertically. So then our height would be half as tall. So it would look like this. All right, and then the horizontal stuff is works very similar. So let's say I wanted to graph y equals f of 2x then what we said uh, happens with a number bigger than one on the inside is it actually shrinks it horizontally. So shrinking by a factor of two horizontally is going to make the, the width. So I'm kind of using the this max and this min. So from our original, we had like this max and this min, and then these two zeros. Those are kind of like nice points to gauge like how big your function is um, in comparison to the original. So the original, we just chose A and B to represent those. So when we, when we shrink this one horizontally by a factor of two, those zeros are going to then be uh, half the distance from the origin.
it's still going to be just as tall because we didn't do any stretching or shrinking vertically. So another bad one, but I'm hoping you guys get the picture. It's shrunk in this direction. And then y equals f of 1 half x is going to expand it. So we'll go from negative 2b to 2b. Height's still the same. And we have something that looks like this. And none of these, none of these uh, graphs are actually the same. They're all different. Um, they all have different values uh, at some given x, like um, at, at, at x equals b right here, you have the value of negative a. At x equals b right here, you have some positive value. At x equals b on this one, it's 0. x equals b on this one is 0, but um, it's not the same everywhere. So all of these are different graphs. Um, doing the stretching and shrinking in one direction is not the same as doing it in the other direction. That's where I was trying to go with that. And then our last thing is the notion of even and odd functions. So an even function is a function f such that for every x in its domain, f of negative x equals f of x. So that's just the definition of an even function. And I'll just say ie does the same thing as we said uh, a couple sections ago as a function that has symmetry about the y-axis. So even function just is synonymous with symmetry about the y-axis. And then odd function uh, is not uh, what you might expect it to be something that has symmetry about the x-axis, but it's not. Um, it does have a form of symmetry, though. So, so a function f such that for every x in its domain, f of negative x, instead of equaling f of x, equals negative f of x. And that's what we said before as being a function with symmetry about the origin. And in case you forgot what that means, that means uh, if you rotated the graph about the origin by 180 degrees, um, then you'd get, like, if, if you do that action, rotate about the origin by 180 degrees, and you get the same function, uh, that's what it means to be odd or to have symmetry about the origin. All right, so let's go through the examples. Determine uh, even, odd, or neither for these three functions. So we have f of x equals x cubed plus x, g of x 
is x cubed plus x squared. h of x is x squared plus 1. So we're going to test each of these for um, symmetry. So uh, let's check and see if this first one's even. Well, I guess all we're doing to check either of them is, is what is f of negative x. So f of negative x, is it going to be f of x? Is it going to be negative f of x? Or is it not going to be either of those? So f of negative x, let's see, f of x was x cubed plus 3. So negative x just gets plugged in there. And then negative x cubed is... Uh, stays negative because the negative one gets cubed uh, and then minus x so this is what f of negative x is and then I can write that as negative x cubed plus x and x cubed plus x was f of x so this is actually negative f of x and so this function right here is odd uh, because f of negative x equaled negative f of x. All right, and then b, g of negative x. So g of x was x cubed plus x squared. So negative x, we get negative x cubed plus negative x squared, which is negative x cubed minus, uh, not minus, plus x squared. Um, and let's just run through and see, like, so g of x was x cubed plus x squared, and negative g of x is negative x cubed minus x squared. And neither of those are that. So this one is neither even or odd. And then the last function, h. h was x squared plus 1. So h of minus x is minus x squared plus 1, which is x squared plus 1, which is h of x. So this one was even. All right, um, so that actually finishes up the section. And here are your problems. Um, and again, these problems are due, let's see, on the 15th. So this coming Sunday is the 8th, and we do not have any homework due um, that Sunday. So this homework set, or this homework is going to be part of the set that's due on November 15th. And the problems are 7, 11, 15, 25 through 28, 37, 45, 49, 85, and 87. All right, um, so hopefully all the studying for the midterm is going well if you're watching this before that, but um, I have office hours again on Thursday, so uh, stop by if you would like. All right, have a good day.